Uh, hi to everyone in the room and also watching from home. Uh, I'm Kate Woods. I'm a farmer here at Stone Barns. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jermaine Jenkins, uh, Chief Farm Officer of Fresh Future Farm Inc. in Charleston, South Carolina. Sorry? North Charleston. North Charleston, sorry, South Carolina. Uh, Jermaine is here to present her workshop, How to Build a Grassroots Nonprofit Farm. Um, for those of you tuning in remotely, we urge you to participate by posting questions on Facebook Live. And for those of you in the audience, during the Q&A period, I'll ask you to come up to the front and speak into the microphone so we can record you properly. Uh, thanks so much for coming. And if you're ready, it's all you. Good morning, everybody. Um, you, you already heard um, who I am. But like why I am is because... Uh, I, North Charleston, where I moved to um, in 2007, uh, is a space where there was affordable housing, but not like the logistics so like me and my family as homeowners could build wealth. And you know there uh, wasn't the access to food that we needed in order for my eldest child who had food allergies to get what they needed as well. And I was going out of our neighborhood to buy groceries to meet those needs and, and benefiting the economy of, some, of somebody in the sub, of people in the suburbs. So that's why we do what we do. And if we could quickly um, go through the room and for people who are um, watching, if you can just post like just three words, what you wanna get from this training to make sure I cover as much as possible, we're gonna um, try to do that super fast and we can start with you fresh and just just um speak as loud as you can so everybody can hear and we get different or the repeated um goal um i'm fresh i'm looking to get i, I have a lot of like passion and desire and i'm looking to get some tangible like steps on like how to get things moving okay I needed nonprofit management so much. So I'll, we'll talk later. I'm Lindsay. I'm with the nonprofit, and I'm looking how to move forward in uh, the right pathway towards a nonprofit farm. Okay. I'm JB. Um, I'm looking at how uh, you build the practical parts of farming while also bringing people in, how to balance those things. I'm Isabel, and I run a nonprofit farm as well, which actually has a similar name. It's called Fresh Roots Farm. So I'm just interested in hearing your story and drawing comparisons. My name is Whitney. I'm interested in the steps, the startup, but also the community engagement. Hey, I'm Stacy. I am interested in converting my farm to a nonprofit. I'm Dana. I'm working on a nonprofit farm right now and I, I want to learn more about how you can keep engaging the community and then also balance that with growing enough food to actually feed people. I'm Jacob and uh, community engagement in your story as well. I'm Christine. I'm interested in how you keep a nonprofit financially sustainable and dun 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 <laughs> I, I I don't even know. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs>
Okay. Of a profit farm. Yep. Hello, I'm Sophie. I'm also from South Carolina and a farmer. Um, and so that's, I want to hear your South Carolina farming story and how we can transform farming in South Carolina. Sp Greenville. Greenville. Yeah. I'm Jordan, and I'm interested in the community involvement as well as education. I'm Allison. I'm definitely also interested in the community aspect and engaging the community on a big scale. Hi, I'm hi, I'm Fratz. I'm interested in hearing your story and thinking through if it's um, possible, feasible for me to transition my farm to a nonprofit farm. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I want to learn the logistics and practical ways to start a nonprofit farm and how to involve the community and education aspects. I'm Dan and looking at ways to be an impactful farm. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm a cheesemaker on a for-profit farm and I'm interested in the dairy aspect of this. Dairy farming. Hi, uh, my name's Nelson Sterner. Um, we have a CSA farm on Long Island that's very non-profitable, and I'd like to actually uh, maybe at least break even. Um, so that's my goal. <laughs> I'm Christina, also from Long Island, <laughs> interested in the finances and balancing the needs of the organization and the board versus the needs of the farm. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm just interested to hear all about this, actually, and just kind of see how it can be applicable to my area. You want to jump in here, my man? Sure. <clears throat> Why are you here? Hey, guys, I'm Henry. I have a farm that's a business, and I'm thinking about uh, starting a nonprofit uh, to work with my business. Hi, I'm Stu. I'm interested in uh, the corporate structure, how you uh, form your nonprofit, and then moving forward, like what's the mindset and the differences between a nonprofit and a for profit? Thanks. Hey, Danny. Uh, my name's Danny, and um, I'm interested in partner, like how to build partnerships with nonprofits in the community. My name is Ben, and I'm interested in kind of the first steps and logistics of starting a nonprofit. Hi, my name's Elaine, and I'm here for all of it. Natalie, and uh, financial sustainability. I'm Phoebe, and um, I'm really interested in the grassroots part of this, because I've worked with a bunch of places that are nonprofits, um, like farms and ranches, but they're kind of sustained by millionaires, so interested in a <laughs> more feasible economic structure. I'm Amy. I'm interested in hearing your story and learning more about the nonprofit side. Passing the mic around, um, a lot of what I heard, and just correct me if I'm wrong, is there are folks who want to find, figure out if this is feasible financially? Uh, my story, and I'm going to decenter myself real quick. Um, mechanics of being a nonprofit. Did I miss anything from the folks that didn't have the microphone? Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead um, and decenter myself real quick because I would not be here if it wasn't for the people that work with us. And I'm 48 year old farmer, so according to the statistics, I got a lot 
of years in me. Um, but this has been really hard work because I did it. I did this work because it was necessary, not because I knew how to like farm. And uh, so I didn't have like the nonprofit management, which is a negative and a positive because I didn't have like uh, what I see as a traditional nonprofit mindset behind this. My um, goal is to um, help the young people that work with us lead this work so that I'm not you know, the one person that can run this kind of thing and that our work is replicable. So, you know, I have to start with my family, um, my husband, um, who is our chicken whisperer, uh, you know, like, you know, teaching like birds to like turn in circles, do obstacle courses, things like they will wait for him to tell them what to do. And we're watching this from our like, farm store. My um, son, um, who was here last year with me, he's our farm manager. He's 20 years old, but we started like growing our own food at our house when he was eight. Um, my eldest child, Annick, is like, does all of the, um, like our design work, everything that we need as far as uh, contracts for the folks that are gonna um, come to our Black Farmers Conference that we are gonna host in the state, all of our attire, all the design work, my 24 year old is doing that stuff. And then, um, and, sh and they're our special projects manager. So Maja Pilsen, it just graduated from the College of Charleston and is our store manager who is kind of running things right now. Kenya Cummings, um, the only way I can describe them is they are the gravy to my mashed potatoes. And all of the things that I'm not good at, especially like coaching, I think, you know, inspiration and like being in, being in the trenches with coworkers, I'm good at, but the way that we run our farm, we need coaches because we want to hire the people where they live to do the work. Um, and I think that is everybody, but I also have to acknowledge Latoya Clement, who was our original farm manager and operations manager, Brielle Bowers, you know, who um, managed our store and then um, did some farm work before they moved. And then there was another woman, Joanne, who also worked with us. And because of those people, none of whom had nonprofit management experience, um, we are doing this work. And I guess I'm called on to kind of talk about what we do because people that didn't have exposure, no horticulture degrees, none of that stuff, you know, did this thing in North Charleston. Okay, so um, I was asked to start with um, a success checklist. Um, and if you're, and, and this success checklist is root, rooted in dismantling food apartheid. This is, uh, if you, um, and the first thing, just as wise, is if you want to be a nonprofit farm that has longevity, you need to do that work where you live. And uh, I don't know the exact number, but there have been trillions of dollars probably spent doing the opposite, and nobody's better off as a result. So do not do work if you, and if you answer like no to that question, find organizations or support people who are doing that work where they live. And if the answer is yes, proceed to the next point. <laughs> um, um, one of the things that we had to do, because where we farm was a vacant plot of land that used to be like the playground area for an elementary school. So I had relationships with city council people because we had to get zoning changed. Um, and you know, it was just one council person to begin with, but me as somebody that they did not know, I just started bringing more voting age people, um, d if different races, different um, uh, generations with me. There were more of us every time, all in the same t-shirt, looking at these folks. And by the time they voted on us, uh, or changing the zoning and allowing us to have a lease here, there were like 20 some people. And we're, there was one, one person who knew about us, nine people voted out of 10 for us to, to have this space. Um, other important thing, um, and you can get this, uh, is growing experience. And like I said, before we did this at Fresh Future Farm, we did it at our house. 
uh, a track record for completing a goal that benefits the community. Again, before we started Fresh Future Farm, there was a community garden that um, I helped manage that was a couple blocks away. And by the time that we started this work in 2014, it had been there three years. And it was like continuously operating for seven. Identify a location is super important. Uh, I think I'll talk about that more later on, but uh, if you are you know, working to support the people that live in that community at, through like uh, jobs, living wage, paid jobs, you're gonna have to uh, get money from folks that don't live in that community. So location was explained to me as being super important and I'll just say it now so I don't forget. What I was, I went through a next level entrepreneurship class that said you wanted to be near a street, and this was uh, four year, five years ago, that has 9,000 cars pass a day, at least. And this is for an urban area, it's probably different for a rural area. And where we sit is between one road back in 2014 that had like, um, 19,000 cars pass a day, and the other main road had 11,000 cars passing every day. So um, when I met with the mayor from North Charleston, I took a zoning map with me and said, I, you know, the place that we need, because we're leasing right now from the, the city of North Charleston, has to have all of these ingredients, um, okay? Uh, and then leadership experience um, is also important. I told you that there are some things that I'm not the best at that we um, bring people in, but I think leadership, um, I had experience doing that. Ability to fundraise is also important because if, because um, what I say about myself, I am anti-social justice. I, if, I, if I don't have to talk, I won't, but I have to because we have to raise money for this organization that's like started on, on naked grass. And the other super important thing is that there's persistence, problem solving, and grit involved in starting a farm. Because whether it's a for-profit or a non-profit farm, you're going to experience setbacks all the time. So um, those are important. Are there any questions before we move on? OK, so my background, like I moved to Charleston to go to Johnson Wales University. So my degrees are in bacon and pastry and food service management. Uh, I made the conscious decision because like while I was going to school, I had little kids and I was putting them in different childcare centers until I found one that worked for our family. And I made the conscious decision when I graduated to work at that place to feed kids. Um, I then got a job working for the Low Country Food Bank because of the fact that, you know, I developed trust with these, with the kids who told me that the gourmet stuff that I was making was nasty. So um, I had to kind of rethink how I approached um, healthy food for them. And they brought their parents to ask me questions about the things that we made so they can make them at home. I went to a lot of neighbor works trainings. If um, you haven't heard of that, that's a, a really good organization. Um, and I intentionally attended all of the site, on-site classes so I could learn what other people were doing to do some restorative work around food access around the country. Uh, the, it was the Feeding Innovation Boot Camp that South Carolina Community Loan Fund led that I got some of this information that I needed, excuse me, to um, start this work. And then at the same time, I was going through um, Growing Power's commercial urban agriculture training. So um, my friend Todd and I, you know, co-founded this organization in 2014 on Naked. The only thing we had was grass and fire ants when we started. <laughs> so, um, that's just some of the recognition that we've gotten um, in those like four short years. And I think it's because we started different from most nonprofits. 
Uh, and this is what our space looked like in 2014. And this is what it looked, uh, it's dated 2018, but it looked like that in 2017. And nobody was paid. Silence. <laughs>
one of the things that we just voted on as a board is that if um, folks create intellectual property while they're working for us, they keep most of the money. Yay, board. <laughs> but it, it took us a long time. So I would be, what I would recommend from what I learned is that you get somebody who um, can help you with your financials. An attorney would be helpful. But even with these skill sets, you need people who believe in your vision as much as you do. And if you had limited resources like we did, what I would do if I could go back is just pay somebody to do our accounting from the beginning. Because uh, I have receipts still all over the place because I was doing a lot of the, the heavy li lifting in the beginning. So we're not yet eligible, eligible for grants that require audits. So invest in somebody honest and who also believes in your vision to do your taxes and, and keep your statements together from the beginning. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'd say for that, if you have a tr a trouble like scheduling regular board meetings, I'm, it's gonna, I'm gonna talk about it later on, but part of being a board member is that they prioritize you, you and your work. So if they can't do that, then they shouldn't be on your board. That's, that's an easy way to eliminate folks. Um, but uh, we went from like every other month and now because we have a, like a newish board and we're still trying to grow it, we're meeting monthly. And you can, because of technology, if they can't be in the room with you, you can like zoom some folks in so they can participate. But first criteria for them is that they need to prioritize your work. Um, best practices, um, like I already said a bunch of times, start small and close to home. Um, track record comes before grants. So the way that we did this on the cheap is I take pictures of everything. I've blown up so many phones like um, over the course of our time because even though um, we don't have a marketing department, we had a Facebook page. And you, so you saw that naked land and people can track our progress over the years because we, we post pictures of everything. And um, Anik now like does a better job of it than I did. That's, that's their skill set. So. Um, yeah, my 24-year-old helps us raise like a lot of money because they're very good at doing that stuff. And that's something like when we have our Black Farm Farmers Conference, we'll talk about for those young people in your life who don't want to farm, get them to do your marketing for you. Um, know the history of the soil. Like when I was going through the NeighborWorks training, uh, I attended a class on like affordable placemaking in Detroit, immediately went to the library to learn about the space and know that the Cassabo Native Americans were there um, when it started. And Anik, on top of doing our marketing and social media, is also an artist. So on the back of our grocery store, there is a history of that neighborhood since the beginning of time that include, starts with the Cassabo Native Americans and how the, um, Native Americans populated the state. Um, Begin with diversification in mind. So we are on 0.8 acres, not a full acre. We you know, have a lot of trees and stuff on the perimeter. Uh, and I intentionally do not irrigate our crops because I want to make or create a system where people with limited resources can work it. So we mulch our beds. Um, when we sheet mulch all the time, we were like quickly growing soil. We've, I know have used over like 2,200 yards of wood chips that are free on that space, cardboard from around the corner at the dollar store, um, all free. And we did, again, that for no money in the beginning. So um, with diversification in mind, the way, hold on, let me go back. The way that the farm is laid out is, you know, these are like production crops. We have like an educational space, chicken coop here, 
but this middle space is left open for events. And we just kind of cleaned up our crop tunnel and had our first wedding on site. So we, t we um, you know, will like beat it into us as like students, you have to be diversified to survive. So um, we are getting to a point this year now that there's more people on staff, because I teach folks how to grow like we do, because we grow everything almost exactly the same, that we'll um, have like videos that you can watch to be able to do this where you live, because we want more people to go back to natural farming, which is better than organic, because we don't even use any chemicals to grow this stuff. And um, a way to get out of nonprofit farming early is to take on debt. So don't do it. Reuse, 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 and this should have started at the top. Don't ex exploit your customers. Does anybody not know what that, what exploitation looks like? Okay, um, as an example, uh, you know, yesterday was Giving Tuesday. So uh, nonprofits, the trend, and it's something I think that needs to be unlearned, is to show somebody like at their worst moment benefiting from your service. We don't do that. We talk about how we were able to help people, and if it's that kind of story, we don't share their name or their picture. Is that So yeah, we talked about um, this, and here's with working board of directors, because this is what you're going to need as a nonprofit, because you're going to have limited resources in the beginning, because you have to build a track record before you get dollars. Um, so having a working board where they help you run that organization is super important. And these are some of the, um, the categories that need to be covered, and again, the time and space to make uh, board service a priority. And if the answer is no, then they're not eligible to be on your board. Application and orientation process. We are, this year, we'll like do some education because the other thing I think that is very important, um, if we want to create, like, if we want to dismantle food apartheid, we can't have the same people as board chairs. So um, there are some mentors in my life, and we have a young, a young um, person who is leading our board now that will work with the mentor to get what she needs to do you know, right by us and by herself. Because again, we need to change like, what's been going on. Um, accountant, attorney, donor management bureau, because like, long-term relationships with your funders is the way that you stay um, afloat as a nonprofit farm. Um, but it would be nice also to have um, a board member with a wealth and a Rolodex who isn't afraid to use those things on your behalf. So uh, governance, advocacy, shared fundraising, um, it's good for me or you as the person who's the CEO of your nonprofit to have fundraising skills, but it should not be your task alone. So that's another deal breaker as far as um, board membership. Um, setting goals and working together to create annual budgets um, and board, great boards do not micromanage operations. So another cool example of something that we'll be working to figure out um, in 2020 is because you know, we've, had, we've lost good employees because of housing and childcare is expensive, like our um, employees can bring their kids to the farm um, but one thing I'm talking to my board about actively is we have to figure out workforce housing or um, provide some kind of stipend for our employees to be able to stay there so they can get the full benefit of being in that safe space until they have all they need to, to um, run their own businesses. And um, covering the cost of childcare too is something that we have to figure out. And our board now is open to doing that stuff. Uh, best practices, uh, and it says WIP because it's a work in progress for us too. 
create a budget uh, before you ask for donations and grants. Establish good internal controls. And this is something that we're now doing. We have the resources to, to hire um, an accountant to work with us, but we didn't have this at the beginning. But if I had it to do again, I would not buy a gate. I would buy or pay somebody to do that for us. Um, but business, a business plan is a bonus for a nonprofit farm. You should also have that in place as well. Um, determine all your program costs, the value of infrastructure, your operational ca costs, cash flow, stuff like that matters. And B, you have to be transparent for state and federal reporting purposes. Um, respond decisively to financial hiccups. And I'll give you one. Like there is, like a year or so ago, we just kind of ran out of money. So what I, I decided as the um, chief farm officer is that me and my husband wouldn't get paid because our employees needed a paycheck until we were in a better position. So be prepared to do that. And um, as a result, um, operational reserves are a must. But again, it's, it's tough because you have to build a track record in order to get dollars in the door. So um, about grants, they don't, they're not the, like the be all and the end all because they are not sustainable. This is why you have to have like different revenue streams coming into your space. Uh, um, smaller grants are better because they require less work of you as somebody who's running a farm. Um, and like a, a mistake that people make is chasing grants. And that's something I learned from the gentleman who was the operations manager at when I worked at the food bank, do not chase grants. So, and, and an example of that is, okay, we are, we are centered around the community. So if the grant says we have to hire somebody from outside of the community in order for us to get those dollars, don't do it because it's off mission on top of um, changing like how you roll. Um, government grants are not easy. And one of the things that like Will like told us in his experience or their experience of growing power with government grants, like the grant itself takes 40 hours to complete. Just the application process is 40 hours of your time. So just imagine like what the reporting process is. So if you, um, if you want to pursue a government grant, my recommendation is that you partner with like an edu like a school, a, a college to do that kind of work. So we've never, we've never had those, you know, but hopefully like in 2020, we'll start kind of building those relationships. Uh, and many foundation grants require audits. That's why I recommend the smart investment is you getting an accountant at the beginning of your life. And, uh, Produce results beyond growing food. So, um, you know, my son, I told you, was our farm manager. He was super shy, still super shy. But when I had to take my eldest kid to college, he ran the store. He got us certified as a USDA grocery store. By him, like him and Latoya were there. The two of those folks got us certified. So, you know, those are results. Like, Leadership skills for your employees. Um, building trust with your customers is something we do because we do not judge um, what they buy. And we are a grocery store and not a farmer's market also because um, there hadn't been a grocery store. We, we were the first grocery store in that neighborhood in Sioux South in the 16. Last grocery store closed in 2005. So the, our neighborhood needed a grocery store, not a farmer's market. Uh, and it's important, like output, the raw number of the service provided. And this is tough for us because we do so much. Um, and we're like working or actively partnering with the local college to see how we quantify this stuff. Because we use point of sales. It does not give you like a specific number of people you serve because there's repeat customers, there's people that pay in cash. So, you, so we're trying to figure that out. And then outcomes is which we like report on or show is the result. Learn to speak logic models, because a lot of these um, grants 
are asking for it. And uh, if there's like a community foundation where you live, they can show you how to do this. Or you can just watch a YouTube video and learn how to do it. <laughs> um, and evaluate your work is the other really important thing that's going to help you um, get grants. And um, quite honestly, because you know we like are are growing, a lot of the dollars that we get come from small or middle-sized like family foundations. Um, individual corporate gi um, giving, so that's why it's important to get that online donor management software early too, along with accountant, get that stuff so that people can make donations and then you can have their contact information to establish relationships with those folks. Um, subscribe to a mobile payment service, develop relationships are super key and that's where another way that your board can support you in helping you develop those relationships if you're spending your time growing, growing um, food. Um, document everything for ease and reporting. Uh, and e-newsletters help tell your story. And it's your, your goal in like the individual and corporate giving, a lot of times it's unrestricted and it's the unrestricted dollars that helped they cover your operating costs. Um, thank donors early and often. And your time as a, like a nonprofit farm is limited, so do not like just avoid these popularity voting contests like the plague. No, you don't have time to get a bunch of people to like you so you, you can um, win $5,000. It's not even like worth the money to do that. So you know, just being smart with your time. Uh, partnerships, collaborations, and al alliances. Don't sell yourself short. This is like me recently in Chicago with like Erica Allen with Urban Growers Collective who did all of the project planning with me to come up with our farm. And her one concern for what I wanted to do is that we didn't own the land. And we just had a Kickstarter campaign where we raised the money to buy it. So um, what's important and like another thing, like a place that we learned from is don't say yes to everybody that wants to use your picture in their um, fundraising efforts because like the harm for us is that the implication is that you're getting dollars from those folks years after the relationship is ended. So um, kind of value your intellectual property so you kind of guard yourself from doing that. So the way to do it, I think, is for you to work with organizations that also share your values. Um, Will, like I, my husband and I had the, the honor of like driving, picking Will up from the airport that same year that I was going through like his commercial urban act. So I took him past like the vacant lot in downtown and he just told us, you know, how in early on in his farming career, he did stuff for free. You can't sustain that. So, um, you know, start valuing yourself from the beginning. Um, but, you know, uh, for us to get to where we are right now, that's what we had to do. Because as somebody with limited resources, I had to build a track record in order for people to trust and give us money. So uh, figure out how to make it work. Um, and, and not everybody's your partner, not everybody's your friend. It's legal documentation that determines a partnership so that f um, both parties are clear on what you can and cannot do. And I would st stress that very much around marketing and funding. Like that's where you wanna really have these kind of contracts like in place. Uh, Co-labor is key, key in collaborations. You're not collaborating with somebody where you're doing all the work. Um, allies create alliances. And um, that's some really good information. There's a uh, org, um, the Weathers Group in Columbia, South Carolina, um, that was funded by another like nonprofit org in the state. 
to do like grassroots nonprofit leadership training. So that's where I learned some of this after the fact. <laughs> so I'm telling you now, so you don't, don't um, so it's a lot easier road for you. Uh, and just to go to that, like it's Together at C um, and Sisters of Charity specifically that funded that grassroots leadership training, like well, that was the most helpful like training for me um, to do this work. Um, Grassroots leadership courses so that you can train up your working board to, to help you. Um, and farming lessons if you don't have any experience. I, um, when I worked for the Low Country Food Bank, I went through the Master Gardener program for Clemson University. Got that book, couldn't afford all that stuff. So I went to the internet and just did all, just figured it out in my yard. Um, but, uh, you know, land grant universities um, have beginning farmer programs there. You know, some of them are working towards more regenerative farming. So look for that stuff if you, if that's what you want to do. Urban Growers Collective, I can't stress those folks enough as like a great place to learn. Women's Environmental Institute. I met um, Will there after talking to some stu students at the old school behind us in 2011. Um, but I was really inspired in that space. Um, there's the annual Black Urban Growers Conference, the Bugs Conference just happened. And uh, this past spring, we hosted like the first ever like Black Farmers Conference in the state. I didn't even know that was, that it hadn't happened before. Just that I felt isolated as a black farmer, like an urban farmer specifically. And because we have limited land, I and our customers want, you know, the melons, the beans and stuff that we can't grow, that we need to be in relationship with one another. So that's this, you know, where other orgs have galas, it's going to be that Black Farmers Conference that is our fundraiser. But our goal is to give as much information as we get resources and be an ongoing resource for black farmers in the state, period, with a T. Okay. Okay. Um, with food sovereignty, um, this is our focus, like, and food justice specifically, what people say they're, they're doing food justice work because they don't understand what the definition of food justice is. And essentially, you know, it's food access of, for, and by the people that are impacted. That, and that's what hasn't been happening. So that's, I think, why we've gotten um, recognition. But, um, we also like used a modular building that a car dealership like six miles away from us was going was trying to get rid of as our grocery store. Uh, we're all about job creation and entrepreneurs. And as soon as we could do it, like entry level for us is $15 an hour. And it's still not enough to cover, you know, housing and childcare in Charleston. But um, we offer like educational workshops. You know, along with like natural gardening, we want to get into farming. I, you know, told you I have a culinary degree and my job at the food bank was nutrition coordinator because I like use the food science that I learned to help folks figure out how to make culturally relevant meals that were healthier and faster um, to prepare um, than what folks were used to gardening. And then we spend a lot of time um, focused on the culture because you know, there's a rich Gullah Geechee culture where we are in um, the Charleston area. I've learned from Gullah chefs there, and we incorporate what I learn into like the farm camps that we have with young people. So not only are they learning how to cook okra, but they're learning where okra originated on the planet, measuring like the distance that plant had to travel to get to North Charleston for, for them to be able to eat it. Um, because I, I don't, I wouldn't call myself a foodie, I'm a food nerd um, from like the, like all the science stuff that we had to do in culinary school. But um, I went to a garden, my brothers and I, uh, when I was like four or five years old. And like we were veggie lovers ever since. So if, 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 um, if just like the exposure had that impact on me, if we want young people, to be excited about foods, then we have to, there has to be an educational component. And we have to center um, black children and families in the fact that we're still here today because they did a lot of that growing.
So uh, if you want to support our work and learn more about what we do, um, we have this end of the year campaign that just like launched yesterday and it, we actually changed the goal. Um, here is um, how you can donate to us and like our email address. But if you wanted to direct an email, that's our um, PO box. But I wanted to leave a lot of time for questions. So if we can go ahead and jump into questions. Yes. Hi, uh, I have a question about your grocery store because um, we're just um, trying to figure out the best way to get our food to the community members and um, like how do you determine pricing and then do you harvest everything beforehand and food waste and yeah. Um, so I guess my question specifically is about how, yeah, how do you price your food and how do you in invite community members to to come to you and try things maybe they haven't tried before? To figure out because you want to do like Walmart prices, you know, for people like who are, you know, have like are living with like minimum wage jobs and stuff, but you can't afford to do that. So I read um, Farming While Black and we immediately went to a sliding scale. Um, so it's priced you know, like maybe a suburban grocery store because we have people that come to us from the suburbs because, you know, nothing that we grow travels more than 200 feet from where it's sold. Um, we harvest to order. And then what we do for community members, whether they live in the neighborhood surrounding the farm or not, is we offer a neighborhood discount, which is anywhere from 35 to 100% off. And we just have to find people to fund that so that we can do it. What does hard harvest to order mean? It means um, our st we don't have a lot of storage space, so we'll put just enough like for it to to um, for folks to know what we have. And if we run out, we got walkie talkies to call the farm manager to harvest some more. And we and because like he works and like his day ends like two or three like it stops at a certain point in the day. And folks will just have to come back because we have a, a small staff. And uh, do you find that there's something that you grow that people just aren't interested in eating? Ironically, it's hot peppers. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, because of hot pepper produces so much. But, you know, um, we are, let me go back to that picture. We are um, working to build like a closed loop here. So um, right now there's a food truck that's being converted to a kitchen for us. So, cause folks will buy pickled peppers, but not just fresh peppers because what are you gonna do with like five pounds of peppers unless you're a restaurant? Does that answer the question? Any more questions? Yes. As a nonprofit farm, we've had a lot of issues, especially in urban areas, uh, with theft. Do you guys ever have theft impacting your costs? And what can you do as a nonprofit sustainably to prevent it? There are places, uh, uh, farm manager just called me this morning to say something was missing, but we live in a broken system. So if land was stolen, right, folks um, don't have wealth because of displacement and all these other things that they had no control over, I don't care. The end. Just like we don't use, we don't use pesticides because we don't want to damage the soil. You just, you just find another place to store your stuff and just keep it moving. Until the system's not broken, we don't care about that. Yes. Um, I have kind of two questions. One is, uh, what made you decide to do this form as a nonprofit as opposed to just maybe like an LLC or something that just broke even and didn't actually make profit? Um, 
And then the other question is around um, funding and sustainability. Do you do any um, like any kind of strategic partnerships or anything that helps you figure out how to not solely rely on grants and how to just kind of make it work or, or training programs or something that brings in income in any kind of way? We didn't have resources to be a for-profit and this land was only available to us as a nonprofit. But now like having done it, you know, this was the best way for us to start because um, because we can get resources like our freezer breaks. I do a, a fun um, Instagram video and then people fund like us getting a replacement because we're a nonprofit. Um, and what was the second question again? Around uh, financial stability, around partner, maybe a partnership or any kind of ways to... Well, that's, I think, where like um, having a track record is also super important because when you do, when you build those relationships with funders, uh, they can be a stream of resources. And we have been fortunate to get a lot of press lately. So where um, our sustaining partner packets um, didn't get much traction like a year ago, we're about to send them back out. Yeah, you just you just have to um, make it do what it do, for lack of a better <laughs> term. And and because you know that's the the thing. You know we we waste a lot of time helping people who are like born problem solvers because they have to figure out how to make limited resources work. And um, the way that we roll is you know we saw like our customers trust us enough to tell us what's wrong so we can like change on a dime because we're small and also our employees do as well so um, we're able to kind of listen to what people say um, share internally what folks tell us and then figure them out like on the spot but you know um, there had been a time again the, where we didn't get paid in order to pay other people so so it's super important that you um, do a track record. If you get your accountant and stuff straight from the beginning, you know, it might take you a year to be able to get those foundational grants. And are you doing any um, like fee for service type stuff or anything where you all are charging to do stuff? We are, um, we're doing fee for service stuff this coming year. Okay. So there's right now, like we spent time because Kenya, um, the gravy, Cummings, um, we sat down in a meeting and we planned like 12 months of activities. So there are fee-based activities woven into that space. And you know, I'm teaching a garden class on January 15th. It'll be available online for po folks to buy the following month. Yeah. And we're gonna do some teach-ins and some other things for folks to be able to um, help us cover the cost of doing this outreach work. And then, um, Weddings, weddings like uh, we can have like uh, corporate events at this space as well because of the way that we built it. Any more questions? Yes. Where is most of your funding coming from? Where is most of your funding coming from? And are you looking to get funding from your produce or from other donors or grants? Most of our funding comes from those mid-sized family foundations um, and individual donors. Uh, produce is important to feed the neighborhood, but we, don't, we want to feed the neighborhood no matter how much. So, so we've attached a value to our produce that people with resources pay, and then we find funders to pay for it for the folks who can't. How many people are on your staff? There's six of us now. And most, like, a four are full time and two are part time. A track record before applying for grants, and you know, um, expecting that it might be a year before that money starts coming in. Um, you talked about some of your personal experiences of not taking a paycheck, you and your husband, but can you go, can you dig a bit deeper into what that year looked like and tactics for, you know, <laughs> for keeping the nonprofit going before the money is coming in?
um, Southern dish, but I had grit, <laughs> lots of grits. Um, and, you know, crying all the time. But, you know, like as our support system grew, it got easier. Yeah. Laughing about a lot of um, microaggressions and stuff. And because, like what fed me when we didn't have money was coming and working at a safe space where we can vent about stuff that's happening outside of the farm. That's what helped me immensely. Did somebody asked something funny. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was, you know, like arguments with my husband about what we spend money on and stuff. Uh, just if, and, that, and what was really helpful, because I don't have time to read, I read Will's book on the plane going to and from um, Milwaukee and read about him having the, the same issue. So I knew what to expect, but it was, it was like doubly hard being in the South as a black woman trying to do this work and do it in a way that um, doesn't undermine the people that we're trying to serve. So, yeah. Well, you did it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're still a work in progress. Still a work in progress. I was trying to make sure no one else wanted to ask before I asked all the questions. Um, I love the way you talk about um, just these uh, systems and structures that you have in place or, and that you're trying to put in place around um, child care and, and um, trauma porn and like and any of these things that I just feel like really good foundational structures to have in place along the systems. Are you, um, I'm just trying to figure out how you can share those with people as far as like, um, like, like just I, some of the basics maybe that people don't think about as much as like, you know, you're trying to at least start at $15 an hour. You're trying to figure out childcare. You're start trying to, you know, hire folks from the neighborhood or I, um, I heard you talk about other things that you were saying your, your board is getting um, on board with. And I'm, I'm, I just would love even for myself, but also just for other people doing this work, like a list of like these best practices, things around like things you can implement when you say you're about this work, you know? Like we're having a meeting on Friday, so we can figure that out, and that'll be one of those like nominal fee-based things that you can get from us. Yeah, yeah, and and we'll have all of that available before um, the next Black Farmers Conference that's going to happen like March 29th and 30th. Yeah, yeah, um, and and it'll be available on sliding scale too. Yeah, because we want everybody to grow, but we don't want people to. to people with resources to just take our intellectual property mm -hmm. when they can pay for it. On behalf of Tatiana, who's watching at home, um, when you have a limited staff, how do you approach harvesting specifically? Oh, okay, that's, that's a very good question, Tatiana. Hey. Um, what we do, is and, and another thing that like Will taught us is you don't let volunteers harvest your crops um, <laughs> because you know stuff will come up missing or like uh, or you just you'll end up with less stuff that way. So what we do is our farm manager and actually my mom is she came into town to help with harvesting. So we have people who are trained. Like if interns work with us, they are trained to harvest, but nobody, nobody harvests until they do a whole bunch of sheep mulching. You kind of work your way up to harvesting. So, and, and, and because it's like um, 0.8 acres, as, as long as there's like at least two or three of us on site, like when it comes to that um, harvest to order, like, you know, the customer will pay and then we'll just go out and get it. I'm a mom and a farmer, and I want to know how you handle the legal logistics of uh, parents bringing their kids to the farm. Uh, 
just bring them. Yeah, and, and like uh, uh, my glam baby uh, is um, probably going to be there this afternoon and just kind of hang out in the office while um, the farm manager does his work. And, you know, what's interesting that we found is, you know, uh, Sierra is very antsy inside the building, but we'll just go outside and just pick up wood chips and just chill. And even like when um, another employee who had young children, a, a baby there, baby slept longer outside than they do inside. So um, um, we, I think because we honor one another, like I don't have to worry about somebody suing me, but we, we know that we have to figure out childcare in the future. So uh, we're, we're small enough that um, it's, it's working-ish right now. There's a question up here. I'm wondering, you just mentioned at the end sort of about your bus or the van kitchen type thing. And I think with uh, the organization that I work with and for, um, we talk about sort of not trying to add too many things before we're really doing things well. And I'm wondering, I know you mentioned that you tr attempt to track your data on how many people you're reaching, but it's hard with all the different things. But whether that decision was based on um, an increased need for access or whether that was based on um you know just growth in general that that was a i guess what was Why? that decision made um based um, on the decision for us to like pull in a, a kitchen it was based on wholeness getting back people back to wholeness mm -hmm. and i'm not doing that work you know even though i like have the like skill set to be able to where we found a farm a, a chef graduated from the same college as me who's going to be our farm chef and manage that space. So we'll set, the other goal is that we eliminate waste because we have the kitchen and um, can do culturally relevant heat and eat meals, which improve our margins in the store. So we, we're just going to, that uh, component is going to have to pay for itself. Oh, and then, um, because we're a nonprofit, you know, people can donate stuff to us. So we have like a kitchen that's being worked on, but somebody donated another food truck. So I'm bartering with the farm chef and I'm going to give him a food truck and then we'll pay him. You know, food truck is half of his pay and then he has, and he only works for us part time. So he can do his own thing because we are not the only folks who just skills, skills are not like black people in food service tend to have less opportunity or access to capital. So we're trying to support folks um, in a lot of ways. And what he can do in addition to that is training up somebody else to take his place. And I'm even thinking that we could work with lots of these um, very talented black chefs um, in our space, give them a food truck, and then like pay them half in salary to do that work. And, and all of this, for me, has been like a, a giant recipe where we're just trying to figure out all the ingredients that um, it takes to make it work for everybody. Speaking of ingredients, um, I just wanted to follow up on my question before about staff. What are some of the titles of the, the staff? Um, we're still trying to figure out um, Gravy's title. Um, and then we have like a farm assistant slash chicken whisperer, you know, who is my husband. <laughs> and it says that on our website. Um, and what has the community response been so far? Um, people hug us a lot because um, they can get food on their terms and not be judged. And so if somebody wants neck bones, we get neck bones, you know, for, for them to put in that pot of greens. So um, folks are excited. 
uh, you know, our greens and our fruit are our most popular uh, products, you know, within the community. So similar to what Growing Power did, we're trying to find more land in other places and hire people to live in those places to run it so that we can sell it at this spot. I answer all your questions. Okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about how your board is comprised and what those people take on for roles and how, I guess, they engage with you and you engage with the board? Okay, well, um, right now, uh, Kene Miller was just selected our board chair, and she is like a black yogi that you know does some work in, in Charleston. And she engaged us as a black yogi and would offer like yoga for people to come before our vol monthly volunteer work days. Oh, speaking of which, that's how we get some of the, the, the things that our staff can't do done. We have a monthly farm work day. Um, and that's how we get a lot of stuff done. And then there's other events for us to be able to get corporations to come and do big projects for us. But um, what was the question again? Who is your board? Advisor? Oh, okay. So, so uh, what's important about Kene is she recognized early that like, like I, I got sick off of like the stress. So like Kene was doing yoga for its staff. Like I've had Reiki, Reiki sessions and all that good stuff because we have somebody on, um, on our board who does that work. Um, Steve Saltzman just um, came on and he had experience in North Carolina funding this kind of work and was like I was giving him a tour when our Kickstarter campaign started and he couldn't believe that we did all this stuff, no irrigation, um, no debt, and asked to be on our board to help us make that happen in more places because as uh, communities of color, the mistake that we make is taking on debt. So how do we come up with a, um, a, an open source template that other people can use? And then we have Barbara Wakike, who you know, in her working life was an engineer. Now that she's retired, she is a commissioner with the Arts Commission who's given us funding for mural work and stuff, but she also is an event planner. So we, have, we can have specifically Gullah events at the farm. And you can kind of look at our space and see what that wedding that was rich in Gullah culture looked like. Um, and then Shanique, Shanique um, Brown is our secretary. And, and oh, I didn't say Steve is our treasurer. We're, we're, we still, as a young um, nonprofit, are working to um, bring people on to fill some of the the holes, but Shanique is going to be our secretary, and she actually, as a young person, attended the school that was behind, that is behind our farm. But she um, comes from Comcast, you know, who also did a lot of work on site for us, and she's the person who wants to do the liaison work between, like, bringing, bringing like, black sororities and fraternities in churches to help us fund this outreach. people how to grow their own food, but we're transitioning to a farm, which then has a profit aspect where you're selling something. And do you have any insight about when you have your community and your support, which was getting something for free, and then you're starting to ask for fees from that? Do you have any like insight or? Uh, like free is a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> because all that hard work that you put into growing up food has value. Mm -hmm. um, so there needs to be like an educational like bridge or something and somebody who's kind of subsidized until you work your prices up from free. So yeah, that's, um, that's difficult. Uh, yeah, but I knew like based on like what I learned from Will and stuff that don't do that. Yeah. But you know, like I was saying, we offer 100% discount to some folks. That happens like when regular customers like are off of work or you know, homeless folks that come in. So do you have it set up where the revenue that you generate on the vegetables and fruit alone sort of covers the costs of producing them or is it more integrated? 
you know, we wanted to get to a point and we will, I hope with like some of this work that we're doing around value added, but right now it's like, like what we sell our produce for kind of helps stock the shelves, if that's it. So um, our work, the wor my work and the work of our board is funding like uh, salaries, materials, and other stuff. So it's not set up like you have the retail business, the farm business, the event business, like it's all sort of- It's all, it's a, it's a soup right now. <laughs> and, and what we are working on, like with our chart of accounts is just tr to track it under like this nonprofit umbrella so that we know how many sales how much sales we get from store versus events um, versus like these fee-based things that we'll be doing but that's all in progress so start with that <laughs> Um, I do, and, and um, last year there was a way for me to send that somewhere for folks who signed up for the class to have access. Is that still available? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll definitely um, get this information to you. Um, about how you want people to be able to become their own entrepreneurs. And I was just wondering more about that process because um, I'm part, I'm interested in that myself of like, how do you integrate, do you integrate like people's ideas and make them come into fruition and like, uh-huh. in five years like with an in an entrepreneurial way is um and, and we're like brand new doing this work like but i you know told told our folks until we had somebody like on staff who could really kind of talk to that other than me because i'm you know that that's not my skill set uh there is somebody that's going to work with each individual employee to kind of set up a plan for them so pro their profession professional development will be will center around what they want to do when they leave the farm as an example you know just in conversation with Annick who's doing who like went to school for fashion design um, and is using like that work to like do our social media to help with our um, our merchandising uh, Annick has already like gotten other jobs doing um, web design for like smaller organizations. So web development is something that they expressed an interest in. So we will like over the course of years, give Anik the ability to get that kind of training while they're working and it'll benefit us and them as they move on. And my hope is when Anik, Anik will, we'll always be a client of Anik's so even when they're not employed with us. Hi, um, I actually just have a comment. Um, I wanted to just say I really appreciated your presentation and um, the whole reason why I wanted to come to the Young Farmers Conference was literally for this class. Um, so I'm so happy that I was able to come here and just to hear you speak and to see the work that you've done is really incredible and amazing. And I know you keep saying like it's, it's still a process, but um, yeah, I just really wanted to thank you for like the space that you, you created here and just everything that you shared with us. Um, I'm definitely going to take this all to build my own nonprofit. So thank you. Thank you. That's but, but with that last comment, thank you very much. But the reason that we were able to get to here is because there were people that poured into me, places that I could go to learn how to do these things. And people like, uh, like learning from Will and Erica, like what they did and should not have done when they started, helped us not to like replicate some of those mistakes. So uh, if you don't know how to grow and there are, and leadership is a challenge, you find people in your area or surrounding your area who are not competition, um, 
Give them your time so that you can learn the skill set, helping somebody else. Or, you know, pay for training. But don't go to college to do this. <laughs> so that student loan is getting like, yeah, so yeah. That's for y'all, y'all young people out there. Don't go to college for this. Just go to a farm. <laughs> yeah, same here. came uh, in person and on the live stream. The next live stream will be at 4.15 with Rowan White.